Hey, I'm Andy Stoddard, lead pastor here at St. Matthew's United Methodist Church in Madison. I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to watch this sermon video from Worship Sunday. Uh, we hope that you are blessed by it. We'd love for you to worship with us here at St. Matthew's, either in person at 8.30 or 11 o'clock in the Sanctuary for Traditional Worship, or 11 o'clock in our Hart Hall uh, for our contemporary intersection service. Or you can join us online for any of those services as, as well. Thanks for watching this sermon video. We hope that you're blessed by it. Have a great day. Our gospel lesson this morning is going to come from John's gospel. From John chapter 17, we're reading verses 20 through 26. John 17, 20 through 26. And I invite you to stand as you're able, in body or in spirit, for the reading of our gospel lesson. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I give to them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so they, they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given to me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these that you have given, that you have sent me, I have made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of taking kind of big concepts and trying to distill it down into something that's a little bit more understandable, a little bit more relatable. I think, I think that's a really helpful thing to do when learning complicated things or when studying theology or studying scripture. Let's take the big concept that we may not make much sense to us or that we may not understand and try to bring it down to a more simple to understand thing. For instance, in the Old Testament, I believe you could take the totality of the Old Testament and distill that down to the Ten Commandments. And I think you could take the Ten Commandments and distill that down to love of God and love of neighbor. Every one of the Ten Commandments deals with either how we love God or how we love our neighbor. In fact, that's what Jesus said. Jesus, when someone approached him, they said, good teacher, what's the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said, on this hinges the law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus says, all the Old Testament kind of comes down to that notion of love God, love neighbor. So you could take all this, I think, distill it down to the Ten Commandments, then distill that down to love of God, love of neighbor. And likewise, you can go backwards. Okay, I want to love God, love neighbor. How do I do it? Oh, the Ten Commandments, good place to start. And then build back up. I, I think that's a very helpful thing when trying to understand a complicated subject. So then, as we look at Jesus' ministry, what are some of the things that were important to him? What, were, what are things in Jesus' teaching or in his life that you can tell he valued that he believes were important for us to know? I believe, honestly, if we were to take the heart of Jesus' teaching and distill it down, I think we're going to come out with the, with the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, to me, kind of represents the heart of what Jesus teaches. Because what the Sermon on the Mount does is it takes that Old Testament truth and goes a little bit deeper. It's really focused in the, ten, the Sermon on the Mount. It's really focused on the concept of holiness. That's one of the through lines for Jesus' teaching, holiness. And the Sermon on the Mount really lays that out. So it takes that Old Testament concept. For instance, let's take an Old Testament concept. Thou shalt not murder. It takes that concept. Cool. Like, let's all work really hard today, y'all, to avoid murdering people. Like, if we cannot murder today, it's a good day. You can go to, go to bed, lay your head on your pillow at night. I didn't murder. Go Andy. Good day. So Jesus takes this Old Testament concept, though, goes a little bit deeper. Because he says in the Sermon on the Mount, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you're not in the kingdom of heaven. So what Jesus does is he takes that concept and goes deeper to the heart. 
Because over and over in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. So you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit murder. But I say to you, if you hate someone in your heart, you've committed murder. Ooh, that's harder. Not murdering, most days, simple command. Avoiding tinging your heart with hate, ooh, that's a little bit harder. Jesus takes these truths and implies them to a deeper level. That's a constant teaching of Jesus. How is it with your heart? True holiness is not just holiness of action, but it actually kind of starts with holiness of heart. Not murdering somebody, way to go. Keeping hate from your heart, that's a lot harder. That comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. That, so that, that's a constant teaching. Jesus does that over and over and over in his teaching. That's a constant theme in Jesus' teaching. Other constant themes in his teaching. Um, love. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What's the greatest commandment? To love God and love neighbor. In John 13, we see that he leaves with us a new command that we are to love one another as he has loved us. We see that constant through line in Jesus' teaching. We see in Jesus' teaching a constant through line of evangelism, calling others to himself. What was the last thing he told the apostles before he ascended into heaven? Go forth, make disciples, baptizing them in my name. Make disciples, make converts. He says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all to me. We see that as a constant through line for Jesus. So we see a lot of things in Jesus' ministry and Jesus' teaching that are big deals to him. But in today's passage, we see something that is a huge deal to Jesus that we don't always think about. But I think it's something very important for us as the church to think about. So we're in John 17 today. John is John's such a cool gospel. All the gospels have really neat things about them. But John especially, you know, when we did the series earlier this year, The Bible is a Bookshelf, we looked at how the Bible works. If you remember the Gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are called the synoptic Gospels. Those Gospels are about trying to answer the who, the what, the when, the where questions. John's answering the why question. John, John's stories are out of order. John tells things that no other gospel has. John is not trying to give you a narrative history of everything Jesus did. John tells you at the end of his gospel, this book was written that you may come to believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John's trying to answer the why of Jesus. So his gospel's going to have a little bit different flow and feel to it. So when we read John, you know, we have, we are used to modern concepts like chapters and verses, when the Bible was originally written, there weren't chapters and verses. That was a more modern invention. And by modern, I mean like second century, not like yesterday. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it wasn't in the original stuff. Jesus didn't go, hey, guys, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to say this. Get your red pen out. Everybody got your red pen out, and I'll take notes now. Like these are things that we did to say the Bible better. So when we read John, John 13 to John 17 should be read and understood as one movement. This is one continuous teaching of Jesus. John 13 to John 17 is his last few hours upon the earth. And these are some of the key things that Jesus has for us. We need to understand this in one totality. So John 13, he gives us this new commandment to love one another as he has loved us. But in John 13, we also see the giving of Holy Communion. Very important. Then John 14, the famous passage, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If we're not so, what I've told you, that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. I, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send the advocate. New command, the advocate, the Holy Spirit's coming. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. You can't do anything apart from me. John 16, more great teaching. But then we get to John 17. John 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer. What we see in John 17 is that Jesus is praying, but he's praying for me and for you. He's praying for our church. This is his prayer 
for the church that is to come. The Bible tells us that right now he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf, praying for us now. But John 17 is a specific high priestly prayer that Jesus Christ prayed for us. In this prayer, he's praying for us now. He's praying for our church, for all the church. This is his high priestly prayer for the church. So we see John 17. It's a beautiful passage, y'all. There's some great stuff that Jesus prays for on this passage. One of my favorite verses in all the Bibles in John, John 17, 3, I think it is, where Jesus says, I pray that they may know eternal life. I, I pray that they may have eternal life, which is knowing the Father and the Son who you have sent. In other words, he says, I pray they may have eternal life. Eternal life is not some distant in the future thing, but Jesus says that we can know eternal life, and that is knowing God the Father and the Son who we have sent. We know this through the power of the Holy Spirit. So every time, y'all, every time, every time in your life, you felt the presence of God. Every time, y'all, you felt the assurance of God, the presence of God, the power of God. Every time you've had that, that, that hair on the back of your neck raised moment. Every time you felt God's presence and God's spirit, y'all, that is knowing the Father. That is a foretaste of heaven. That's just, a, that, 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 that's not the whole cake. That's just a little mini cupcake. That's just a taste of what heaven's going to be like. But we don't have to wait till glory to get to experience that goodness of God, to get to experience that power of God. We can experience it now. I pray they may know eternal life, and that is knowing the Father. And the Son who is sent, every time you experience the goodness of the Father, you are experiencing a taste of heaven. So we see that. That's a big deal to Jesus, y'all. He prays about that. He prays about that. Jesus! And today, we see Jesus pray about something that, frankly, you may have never thought about. And frankly, it may not be a big deal to you. But it's a big deal to Jesus. It's such a big deal that he prays about it. He prays, I pray that they may be one. He said, in the same way that you, turn to the Father, the Father and I are one, I pray that they may be one. When we read the ancient Nicene Creed, we see in the Nicene Creed, it says that the Father and the Son are of the same substance, of the same being, eternally begotten, not made of one essence with the Father. We see that in our historic faith that we believe that the Father and the Son are one completely, of the same being, of the same Trinitarian substance. That's how close the Father and the Son are. And he prays that we as the church may be the same, that we may be one, that we may have unity. And the problem is we live in a world where that's very hard to do. We live in a world where disunity and division are the norms, not unity. I, I don't know if you've, I would recommend you watch a, a great documentary called The Social Dilemma. So I think it's a Netflix one. It digs into social media. Social media is predicated upon the concept of engagement. That Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they want engagement. And see, engagement is a neutral term. Engagement is likes. Engagement is shares. But you know what else is engagement? Anger. Fussing. Being angry. Being angry is engagement. You're, you are engaged with something if you're angry at it. And social media has discovered that the angrier you are, the more likely you are to be engaged. The more likely you are to keep hanging out on the social media platform the more likely you are to share it. Even if you're sharing it out of disgust, you're sharing it. And we live in a world right now where it seems like the entire purpose of existing is to make us angry at everything 
all the time. We live in a world, it seems like right now, that's predicated upon division. That division seems to be the desired outcome sometimes. And so the concept of unity is not one that we're familiar with or frankly one that we may not think has any value. And maybe that's fair, but y'all, Jesus Christ invited it so much, he prayed about it. Jesus Christ prayed for unity for his church. So whether we like it, agree with it, or think it's a big deal, it was a big deal to him that we as Christians should strive towards that. Now listen, we're Protestants, y'all. We're not good at unity. That's kind of, pro- protesting and division, it's kind of what we do as Protestants. I have a great book on my shelf. It's called Handbook of Religious Denominations. It's about yay thick. It goes into every denomination in the United States. For 1,600 years, we had two. We had Catholics and, and, and Orthodox. We've got thousands now. You know, we lean more towards division than unity in our churches and everywhere. In our world, that's just, that's, that's human nature. That's human nature. You go over there. I'll stay over here. But Jesus Christ in this prayer prays for us that we may be one as he and the Father are one. And that seems like an impossible task, doesn't it? One of my favorite things that I do as a pastor, um, I love, I, I share with you, there's a lot of stuff that I do that I love. Uh, but one of my favorite things that I, I do is premarital counseling. I, I really love premarital counseling. H- Holly and I were incredibly fortunate when we got married that we had some really good premarital counseling because, I mean, she'll agree with us when she and I are very different. I, she is incredibly optimistic, and I'm incredibly pessimistic. When we first got married, she wanted to go and do stuff, and I wanted to stay at home and look at the carpet. We just have, particularly when we were younger, now we're both just tired and want to go to bed. You know, that's all we want now. You know. But when we were younger, we had some real differences of opinion and different things that we could have had a lot of conflict over. And we had, we had a really good pastoral counselor who helped us kind of figure these things out and helped us get some good ground rules for marriage. And so I, I enjoy doing that now with couples that are doing premarital counseling. And I, and I tell them when couples get married, I found most marital conflict comes from what I call the three F's. Family, finances, and faith. And you look in your own marriage. I guarantee you, most conflict's going to come from one of those three places. Family, finances, or faith. By family, I mean uh, family of origin, how you were raised, how your family values stuff, what your family does, what your traditions are. And most likely, your spouse is going to have a different perspective on some of that. And a lot of conflict's going to come from that. And you also have the family you make. How do we raise our kids? How many kids do we have? You know, that, that type of stuff. Family's a big Thing of conflict. Finances, money. Yeah, we just, we, everybody argues about money. That's just money, duh. Yeah. And then faith. And this is one of the things I give to couples to help them navigate their issues. You have to ask yourself when you're in conflict is this a preference or is this a value? Preferences are not bad. They're not bad. We all have preferences. And most of us like our preference. That's why we prefer them. Very few of us have preferences that we disagree with or that we don't like. We've all got preferences. That stuff we like or don't like. But that really isn't super important. As my friend Tim would say, those aren't kingdom issues. You may like them, but they're not kingdom issues. Values are deeper. Values are deeper. Those are deep in the core of your being. And when a couple is fussing, when a church is fussing, a lot of times we're fussing not about values but about preferences, about the stuff we like, but they aren't kingdom issues. Most of our conflict comes from preference not from values. 
Now, there's some stuff we need to take pretty serious. Like uh, Dr. Bryant in the seminary used to always say, uh, there were three crosses at Mount Calvary, but only one was worth dying on. Not every cross is worth dying on. As a pastor, there are some hills that I'll die on. I'll die on the hill of race. Yep, sure will. I'll, I'll die on that hill every day of the week. Sure, sure will. I will not die on the hill of the color of the carpet. I do not care. I could really, I, I, I don't, I don't, I know how to say it. I, I don't care. Dr. Brown said, there are some crosses worth dying upon. The coal of the toilet paper is not one of those crosses. As we build, renovate, all that kind of stuff, I, 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 Andy Stoddard does not care how things look most of the time. I, I care about how we use the space for God's glory and how it appears, but that, the color of the carpet to me is a preference that I don't care about. It, for some of us, it's a big deal. For some of you, it is a value. It's not a value to me. It's a preference, so I'm not going to have much of an opinion on it because it's, to me, it's not worth fussing over. We have to understand what are our preferences and what are our values. Preferences can be adjusted and negotiated and sacrificed upon. Values are deep-seated truths that define us. And the value that should define us as a church is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is the value that matters. That is what counts. Not my preference. As a pastor and as a leader, I try, to make, I try my best not to make decisions that are my preference. Just because it's my preference doesn't make it right. Just because I like it doesn't make it right. Just because I like it doesn't mean it's what our church should do. The fact that I like it doesn't really matter much in the grand scheme of things. What matters is not doing things based off my preference or your preference, but doing things based off the value that Jesus Christ is Lord and does everything we do, everything we do, everything we do, predicated upon the fact that Christ is Lord and we want to live into the power of the gospel and we want all the world to know the goodness of Jesus Christ. I don't just pray words in church to kill time. Every Sunday when I pray over the offering, I pray, bless these tithes and offerings and use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom that all the world may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what it's about. It is about living into the value of how do folks know Jesus Christ. That's what counts. That's what matters, y'all. And if we put Jesus Christ in the middle of our life together, our differences are beautiful. I, I'm not a Baptist, but I love my Baptist brothers and sisters and praise God for the work they're doing for the kingdom. I'm not Catholic, but praise God for my Catholic brothers and sisters and the work they're doing for the kingdom. Just because I don't have their same preference doesn't mean that we're not on the same team. When we put Jesus Christ in the center of our life together as a church, God will do amazing things. When he is in the center of our life, we have unity and we have shared mission and shared values because he is in the center. But if we put our preferences in the center, then we'll destroy each other. And we'll fuss with each other. And we'll fight with each other. Because we're not going to share the same preferences. What are our values? And what are our preferences? Our values have to be based upon the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what matters. And that's what we're about. And when we put Jesus in the center, our differences, our preferences, paint a beautiful mosaic of the body of Christ. When Christ is in the center, if I'm in the center, or you're in the center, or our preference is the center, it will lead to disunity. So for our church, for our families, 
and in our very lives, may we always place Jesus Christ in the center. And when he is in the center of our life together, we will find the unity and the life that comes only through him. He prays today that we may be one. When he is at the center, it will be so. Let us pray.